the spirit and the real essence of Bhagavad Gita from the minds and hearts of most Western readers. So is Bhagavad Gita so mysterious, obscure, and hard to understand that we have to interpret it? No, Bhagavad Gita is as clear as a bell. It's as clear as the beautiful blue sky I'm looking at today on a cold winter day. Uh, you know how that cold, crisp winter weather comes in and just sweeps all the dust out of the air and you can see for miles and miles? Well, that's Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is the absolute truth spoken by the original Supreme Personality of Godhead. But what could be clearer than that? So, Dharma Kshetre, Kurukshetre. The scene is in Kurukshetra. You can go to Kurukshetra today, and many people still go there uh, to perform religious activities and to inquire into the absolute truth. Well, this is the function of a place of pilgrimage. So, if somebody goes to a place of pilgrimage uh, just as a tourist, and we see this all the time in India now, uh, people go on a big tour bus, and, you know, they have the guy announcing, oh, here's this temple, here's that temple. So they go through the whole place, maybe they go in a couple of temples, and then they go to some restaurant and eat hamburgers or whatever, and then they go home. They never inquire from real uh, people who have developed wisdom there. Well, why do they go to the pilgrimage place? Just to see the temples? And then they go home and nothing has changed. So this is Gokhara. This is cows and asses. Go means cow. Kara means ass or donkey. Uh, if you've ever known a donkey, they're not very uh, advanced. They have very simple mind, very simple taste. They work very hard. They'll work all day, in fact, just for a little handful of grass, which is available anywhere. So, in other words, they're stupid, uh, very stupid, and they can be exploited because of that. So, a kahara, an ass, is working very hard, and go, a cow, is simply uh, standing in the field, eating grass all day. They don't have much of an intellectual life. They don't even have much of a social life. They travel in herds. Uh, they just follow the leader wherever they go. And because of this, they never really come to a uh, consummate understanding of life, the purpose of life, the meaning of life, the path of self-realization, spiritual knowledge. Huh? They never come to these things. Why? Because these things are outside the circle of normal life. You will not encounter information on self-realization in your workplace. Huh? They're never going to take you on a course of uh, how to realize your perfect body, uh, you know, at your job. So the kaharas, the, the hard workers, uh, they may amass some little bit of money, but they can't take that with them when they leave this body. However, the self-realization, the wisdom that you get from meditation and from chanting and from study of the Vedas, you can take that with you because it's going to change your destination after death. That's the whole point of spiritual life, to influence where we go in the next body. Uh, because in this body, if we identify with the material body, then we become covered over by all the material qualities, like we were speaking of itcha, dvesha, samutena, covered over with desire and hate. Because if we desire so many things huh, from watching television. Now all of a sudden we have to have a beautiful girlfriend, a beautiful car, uh, a beautiful house in the suburbs with all amenities and so on and so forth, an active social life, uh, Caribbean vacations and so on and so etc. ad infinitum. And if we don't have all these things, we, we develop the desire to have them. Now if we can't get them, uh, then dresha, Huh? hate, envy. We envy those who do have them, and we hate ourselves for failing to achieve them. So this is material consciousness. Uh, it's terrible. It's, it's very low-class kind of consciousness. Uh, it's a very negative kind of consciousness. A spiritual consciousness is not like that. 
spiritual consciousness is based on love. So, first of all, we love God. And then we love ourselves because we are part and parcels of God. And similarly, we love other people because they are also the same. And everyone can become self-realized. There's lots and lots of room in the spiritual world. It's not a competition. It is rather a cooperative effort among spiritual community members. And that's the way the esoteric teaching is structured, uh, that we form small groups and work together to help one another become self-realized. Uh, this is the way to get out of the law of karma. Uh, as the Brahma Samhita said, every living entity from Lord Brahma down to insignificant microbial germs are spiritual living entities, spirit souls. They all have the same opportunity for self-realization. But because they come into this material world, they are subjected to the law of karma. And the law of karma is driving us from body to body, from planet to planet, from situation to situation, all over the universe. We've been all over this universe in thousands and millions of bodies, uh, from heavenly planets down to the hellish planets. And in every situation of life, we're still thinking, oh, I'm going to enjoy I am going to become the big enjoyer around here. Just you wait and see. Uh, but it never happens because constitutionally, we are part and parcel of the Supreme. We're servants of the Supreme. We're meant to be servants constitutionally. And we're actually unhappy being enjoyers because we're not fit for it. So just because we're conditioned by television and so much other media nonsense to uh, try to attain different positions of enjoyment. Actually, these uh, positions are unsuitable for us. And even if we do attain them, we can't hold on to them for very long. You know, look at the big guys. Uh, you know, there's a saying up in New York where I come from, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. So look at Saddam Hussein. You know, he had uh, dozens of palaces and any woman he wanted. And, you know, he had so much power. But then the next day, the Allies come in and he's finished. So any one of us can be finished any moment. This is the material world, people. And everything in this world is temporary. So we have to understand our real position. Our real position is that we need the help of Krishna to get out of this mess. We can't get out of it on our own. That's why Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita because Arjuna was in this material consciousness, or apparently he took the role of a person in material consciousness, overwhelmed by family and bodily connections. And so Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita just to enlighten him, to get him out of his misery, to get him out of his problem. So in the first chapter, the stage is set with Krishna and Arjuna, standing between the two armies, ready to fight, and Arjuna's breaking down and saying, no, I can't do it. So then in the second chapter, uh, Krishna begins to speak this great spiritual knowledge that leads to liberation. And what's the first thing he tells Arjuna? Arjuna, you're not this body. You're an eternal spirit soul. And your business is to attain your eternal perfect body. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of My Perfect Body. This is David Hughes, your host, reminding you to visit us on the web at esotericteaching.org, where you can purchase the complete Esoteric Teaching Introductory Seminar DVD and many CDs of transcendental music and mantras.